Good morning. It's good to be here with all of you as we gather at the start of our academic year, a year marked by COVID-19, by the United States presidential election, and by the global racial justice movement. A few weeks ago, as I was out for a walk, I saw a sign in a store window that read, white supremacy is not the shark, it is the water. I've been thinking about that sign nonstop and I've come to understand that statement to mean white supremacy is not one thing that we can see swimming toward us in the dark, that we can move away from or avoid. It is not contained or encapsulated or even always clearly recognizable for what it is, the way we all recognize a shark. Instead, it is amorphous and shape-shifting and like water, it can take on the form of whatever container is holding it. If any one of us saw a shark swimming toward us in the ocean, we would know we were in danger and we would respond with urgency. But the water of white supremacy and privilege can be harder to see, particularly for white people, precisely because we are swimming in it, immersed in it, and it is all around us. In this country, that water is our political system, our educational system, our financial system, our housing system, and for those of us who are white, it's easy to become habituated to it because it has shaped every aspect of our lives for all of our lives. And in fact, in many ways, we have benefited from it. The greatest danger then is not the shark, it is the water. And as I thought about what I wanted to say today, I think the key question for us is, what is the water that we are swimming in here at Berkeley? We can all name many of the sharks, specific and clear examples of inequity or racism that as an institution we must address. Racial microaggressions, lack of diversity in our student, faculty, and staff populations, lack of BIPOC leadership across the institution, these are just a few. But what is the water? What is so enveloping that we may not see it or recognize its impact? We are one of the greatest performing arts institutions in the world. And at the center of this institution is an artistic value system or systems plural that are the primary defining structures of the institution. Consider how we define excellence in the art forms we teach determines our curriculum, our pedagogy, who we admit and who we don't, how we award and scholarship those who we admit, the faculty that we hire, what our students perform, even the donors we attract. Although we're a merged institution, the artistic value systems are very different at the college and the conservatory. As the leader of the conservatory, I'd like now to hone in on the specifics of the conservatory. I believe that the central challenge we face as a conservatory with an aim to become a racially just institution is that our mission is built on the teaching of what are often referred to as classical art forms. In truth, I believe that a more accurate term for these forms would be Europeanist high art forms. One of the definitions of classical art is that it reinforces the existing social structure. So as a conservatory, we have to start by acknowledging that the foundation upon which our institution is built, which is the art forms we teach and value, are forms that evolved in a primarily white society created for and supported by the elite literally nobility and royalty. And these art forms function to reinforce and support the inequity of that social structure. Further, they are art forms which by definition did not include contributions of black and brown people in the first three centuries of their evolution. I believe that if conservatories are serious about racial justice, we must come to a reckoning about these central facts. The teaching of these art forms and the love of them is not itself the issue. The issue is that conservatories have existed and thrived based on the sometimes unspoken but sometimes stated belief that classical Europeanist aesthetics sit at the top of the artistic hierarchy. And because these art forms came from a predominantly white culture and society, if conservatories elevate these forms as the standard by which all other artistic endeavor is measured, then we inherently create a racially unjust artistic value system 
and accompanying educational structure. And this is the water that we in the performing arts have been swimming in for centuries. To be clear, this does not diminish the beauty or power of these art forms, and I'm absolutely not suggesting that we should stop teaching them. But I am suggesting that we disentangle the art forms themselves, symphonic music, ballet, opera, etc., from the value systems in which they are embedded. We must challenge ourselves to examine the racial bias that is built into the conservatory model, not just this conservatory, but all conservatories, and in doing so, seek to understand and meaningfully address some of the root causes for conservatories to remain primarily white spaces, and spaces in which black faculty, staff, and students consistently report that they do not feel supported, welcomed, or valued. For example, let's think about that word, classical. Most conservatories do not say in their marketing materials, come study here, we teach white Europeanist aesthetics. No, they say, come here to study classical music or dance or theater, with the implicit understanding that classical means Europeanist. So classical training, which many students interpret as the unassailable foundation of virtuosity and skill, the very pinnacle of artistic excellence is therefore defined as white and European. Another interesting word is technique. We assess students who apply to our school based on their technique, but what do we mean by this word? Let's use dance as an example. In the field of dance, the word technique is often understood to mean the particular way of training the body that prepares the dancer for ballet, the Europeanist high art form. Now the truth is, and I'm sure this is obvious, there is technique and a skill set required for every form of dance. So why does the word technique become shorthand for the specific way of training the body that applies to ballet? I think the answer is clear. It's because not just in conservatories, but within the field itself, there still exists a presumption of superiority of ballet as a training method and an aesthetic system above all other forms. So the word technique becomes shorthand for ballet technique. And much less often do you hear the terms hip hop technique, jazz dance technique, etc. I think this is how white supremacy becomes the water in which we swim, embedded so deeply into the very language of our art forms that we almost do not even question it. As long as we continue to use this language, we support belief systems about quality and virtuosity, about what defines technique, what is the, quote, classical canon, and in doing so, we elevate one particular aesthetic value system and arguably devalue all others. We create a hierarchy that places white European art forms at the top. So what do we do? Classical art forms reinforce the existing social order. Avant-garde art challenges it. My proposal is that we become an avant-garde conservatory not in what we teach, but in how we teach it. If we are to create true racial justice at Boston Conservatory at Berkeley and in our field, we must start by recognizing and articulating for our students that all art is a cultural document. And the performing arts in particular tell us the story of the society in which they evolved, the dynamics around gender, power, resources, race, values, and belief systems that what we call classical music, dance, and theater are in fact European classical forms, that every culture has classical art forms, and that Europeanist aesthetics are not inherently superior to any other art form, whether it is vernacular or folk or avant-garde or classical from any other culture. To truly address systemic racism in our institution, we need to do three things. One, dismantle the value system that surrounds European classical forms. It does not mean we stop teaching them or that we stop loving or valuing those forms, but it does mean we bring them down off the pedestal of artistic superiority that implies that somehow these forms are of greater value or that practitioners of these forms have greater skill and more technique than other art forms. Two, recognize and name the structural racism that is embedded in conservatories and in what we refer to as classical, 
but which is actually Europeanist music, dance, and theater. Recognize that the value systems that still exist in many corners of the performing arts today and which place European classicism in an exalted position are relics of white privilege and be willing to give up that white privilege. And three, deal with the sharks through education and training, hiring practices, admissions practices, curricular change, performance programming, and all of the other initiatives that will create change here. We're at a historic turning point, a watershed moment, if you will, where there are perspectives and voices casting a new light on the inequities of the system we've been swimming in, guiding us toward new waters, toward a more just campus and world. I look forward to navigating these new waters together. Thank you.